All right, Mina Kimes is here. She's witnessing a historic moment. <laughs> this is the last time I'm wearing a Tom Brady jersey right here. I am, I am pledging my allegiance to Cam Newton. <laughs> <laughs> from from this moment on, thank you for the 20 years, Tom Brady. I loved it. I loved winning six Super Bowls. I love being relevant every year. I'm going to continue to wish you well in Tampa Bay. But this is now a Cam Newton house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you hate it. You hate this. I have so many thoughts. So many thoughts. Um, first, I feel like every time I do your show, uh, people get so angry that we always spend the first 20 minutes talking about something Patriots adjacent, even if like it could be <laughs> in the Super Bowl, the Patriots are long eliminated somehow like 20 to 25 minutes we will mm. do. But the Patriots are the most interesting team in football right now. So it's actually relevant. Like this is yeah. actually a, a thing we should be talking about. It's such a fun subplot because there's there's like multiple things going on. One, the most fun part of it is that Cam Newton's really fun to watch play football if he's healthy. Yes. I'm just excited that he's starting for a team. I think the process played out the way it should have played out. I think, you know, obviously teams were a little nervous. He hasn't been healthy in two years and he's a guy who wants 20 million a year. Probably the market wasn't there. Belichick slow played it. I think he <laughs> took less than maybe he should have, you know, from say the chargers. But that he would, knows if he if he crushes it for the Pats for one year, that's a one hundred million dollar contract waiting for him, right? Yeah, it's I, when Revis signed with the Patriots, I analogized it to analogize is that right. Anyways, yeah, it, it's good. like it's like when an actor does um like an indie film, right, to get their cred back, to to get a mm. few awards under their belt, then they can go back to the Marvel movies. That's basically what Cam's doing here. I think. Great. They got a little lucky. They got a little lucky. I mean, he slow played it, but it wasn't just the health thing. There's a number of reasons why teams didn't bite, I think. And New England was fortunate. Well, so they got lucky with two teams specifically. The Chicago Bears. It's <laughs> indefensible. It's just indefensible. You could, That's you the could worst talk one. to any Chicago fan and be like, why didn't you guys sign Cam Newton? And mm -hmm. there's no answer. The answer is basically, well... If you do that, then you got to give up on Mitch Trubisky. And then the answer to that is, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to give up on Mitch Trubisky. That's indefensible. And then I don't know what the fuck the Chargers are doing where they're just like, yeah, Tyrod Taylor. It's like Cam Newton's much better than Tyrod Taylor. What are you doing? It's not about Tyrod Taylor. They wanted Justin Herbert. What this? Okay, so. Yeah, but he's not going to start this year. Do you, th yeah, do you think he's starting? They want him to start at some point, probably this year, because rookie quarterbacks always start. Okay, year one. Okay, Al fair. Always, always. And. You don't want Cam Newton in that locker room. I mean, there's a number of teams around the NFL. Forget the Chargers. I think you're right that they're the most obvious choice because they're a really good team otherwise and should compete. But there's yeah. a number of teams with rookie quarterbacks, quarterbacks on rookie contracts who should, like Cam Newton is better than their quarterbacks, but they don't want their rookie quarterback to lose the competition. People always forget how often this happens in the NFL, that it's not a real meritocracy. So once the Chargers decided, we're going to take a guy, we're going to take Justin Herbert, Cam Newton was never an option. You cannot have Cam Newton in any locker room where a quarterback has questions around him because mm. the team's going to rally around him immediately. He is that type of guy. Yeah. What is there any other teams you think blew it? Chicago's the worst one. Um, the I mean, Chicago like, thing, I actually feel bad for the Bears fans because <laughs> the, the quarterback position has, you know, been a sore spot for decades. And it's just funny that this was such an obvious win every possible way, and they just missed it. He would have looked great, too, like in a Bears jersey, I thought. Um, I mean, there's teams like Jacksonville, but they're not trying to win. They're doing yeah. a Miami Light thing. So every team has a different timeline and plan. So teams that are actually competitive and could use him as a starter, you're actually in a really small number of teams, I think. Yeah, and you also have a situation where we have... A lot of quarterbacks. Now, we don't have 32 good quarterbacks, but I think we have a lot of teams who are comfortable with their quarterback situation. Whether they should be is a different topic, but we've had multiple drafts in a row where we've had, you know, new blood each year coming in and there's just, there's only so many spots. And I think with Cam, it's almost insulting to bring him in and be like, hey man, you're going to have to compete for the job. Do you see the video of him today? Uh Oh, I've like watched cash. all the videos. You watch every I've watched video, everything. Which yeah, is your favorite I mean, video? <laughs> I I just like his personality. I I think you know we had this quarterback. God bless him, our guy Tom Brady. 
who had just mastered the art of of saying nothing and being diplomatic, right? And just you always had to read between the lines and what is is Tom upset he sold his house? What there was just so much mystery. And with Cam, Cam's just Cam. He is who he is. He's gonna be upfront all the time. He's gonna be dynamic. He's there's gonna be real energy. And it's like if I'm moving on from my first wife, who I just <laughs> spent 20 years with. I want my second wife to be different than my first wife. And he's different in so many ways. I think he opens up the offense. I've been thinking about it for a week. McDaniels mm. has to feel like he won the lottery. Oh, He gets to do all these just... things now that he couldn't do with Brady. Brady couldn't move. I did a 45-minute pod on Jarrett Stidham. I think I texted you when I was watching the preseason. Oh, yeah, 45 yeah. minutes of my life spent watching Jarrett Stidham uh, college and preseason tape to prepare for the season. Because all offseason, the B reporters and... Everyone around New England was telling us that, you know, they just love Stidham. And I know that's not a New England accent, but I'm trying to approximate the... I liked it. I liked the effort. Oh, he's wicked good. I don't know. And we were told... (laughs) That was terrible. But we were told, right? Trust in Bill. Um, But when you watched, I didn't see... First of all, the greatest discrepancy between NFL teams and fans is that preseason means anything. Fans, right. and I, I count myself, right? And, and sure, that's how Russell Wilson won his job in Seattle, the team I root for. But for the most part, a guy doing decently well in preseason means absolutely nothing to your football team, okay? And, and fans fall for it every time. He looked fine, okay? He, like, made a few decent intermediate-level completions off of play action. He took too many sacks. He wasn't quite as mobile as I thought he would be. But it seemed very obvious that at the beginning of this offseason, New England was trying to build a quarterback-proof offense, Right. You, you knew it was going to be some early 2000s Patriots stuff, just ton of two running back sets and running the ball. Mm. And they drafted those tight ends. Now he gets Cam Newton to play with. I mean, I, it's unbelievable. And the thing that's always been hard for me about hating on the Patriots is how much I love everything about them, uh, in particular, the way Bill Belichick runs that football team, which is he is completely agnostic to scheme, culture, like not culture, but he will change literally everything they do at the drop of a hat. And I adore that because it's so rare in the NFL. We see it all the time with the Patriots defense. We've seen it with the offense. You know, from rooting for this team over the years, they have morphed into different iterations. Even during Brady's career, they're going to change everything they do this season. If the season happens, it's going to be amazing to watch. Well, it has the ceiling went so much higher. Yeah. Stidham even if it worked out and he was like, I think solid was a, was a reasonable outcome better than solid would have been exciting, but there was never going to be a case where he was going to like light it up. You know, I I just don't think he has the kind of talent. Could he have been like a really solid Garoppolo in his first Niners year kind of thing where his game manager maybe makes one mistake a half, but can make some good throws too, can drive the car straight basically. And now with Cam, it's like, all right, can we win the AFC? Like, and this is so? what we do. You, well, this you is there? what we do. Is, Are you there? We, we do it as sports fans, right? You you start, you think about the best case scenarios for a week. And then after a week, I'm like, man, we could win the AFC with Cam. KC, you know, the salary cap issues. You, know, you never know with them. They got a lot of, <laughs> lot of good injury luck last year. And you start talking to yourself. I didn't have this kind of hope a week ago, I guess is my point. You think they're the third best team in the AFC right now? You feeling that? I think they're in the. I think they're in the top five. I don't they're know what to five. make of yeah. Buffalo because I think Buffalo is going to get a lot of momentum. As it, yeah. watch out for Buffalo, and it's usually that's bad in the NFL when everybody lines up. Um, These guys here, they are. It's going to happen. I think that it's Kansas City and Baltimore, and then there's kind of a mess of like five or six decent AFC teams: your Bills, your Pats, your Titans, your Colts. Um, I think the Steelers and Browns are kind of sneaky there too. But New England, you have the best secondary. Um, it's the front seven. It's Bill Belichick. It doesn't matter who's playing. On offense, the line's healthy, right? You get uh, your center back, Andrews. Your steel players still suck. But there is but- literally no way they could suck more than they did last year, and they're healthy. So that helps. There are at least people that might have talent. We didn't see it last year. It was a bad fit with Brady, but I... Like, I'm not willing to give up on Nikhil Harry after a year because he was banged up half the year and then his quarterback didn't right. trust him. So it was good. Um, he was he looked terrible. He's he was hurt. He was he hurt. And plus, I mean, they're slow, right? They're they are an uh, like if you just look at their 40 times, I think they're the slowest in the NFL. But um 
the advantage of having a quarterback like Cam is defenses can't play man because you can't turn your back on a mobile quarterback. That's going to help all your slow receivers. Are we have we hit twenty three minutes yet of Patriots? No, we're time? done. <laughs> no, I had I had one more quick question though. Okay, how much how much fun is it that all the people who love Cam now have to root for the Patriots? The this is my favorite re- wrinkle. The whole thing. It's so good. It's through the roof, man. Like I, the second he is wearing like the all white with the number one zone read, I'm going to lose my mind. And then the camera is going to cut to all these Patriots fans and the cognitive dissonance is going to be out of control. And I think there's so many people like me. I don't know how that's going to play out. I really don't know. It's like a science experiment. Hey, I I guess I should ask this question. Are we sure we're going to have a football season? (sighs) Am I allowed to say I hope so? Is that, uh, yeah. are we allowed yes. to say that? Because well, especially it, now that you're on NFL Live, you <laughs> kind of needed, needed NFL yeah. season. Yeah, that would be, that'd be a tough scene for me if there's no season. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I f- I'm sure you feel this way too. As a professional taker, it's really not fun being asked to weigh in on issues of science and probability. It's, I feel like yeah. a total fraud every time I'm asked about this stuff, right? Um, I can tell you what I'm hearing, and I mean, I'm not Adam Schefter over here, but the NFL, I think, feels from based on what I've heard from people that if baseball and basketball happen, there's no way they can't in some way. Um, yeah. It might be a little later. That's something that the schedule left as a contingency, a, a few weeks pushed back, and then everything gets pushed back down the road. But if those sports happen, football is going to happen. The best thing I've heard the best point I've heard for why it's going to happen or if it does happen, why it would happen is once it starts, all the contracts are guaranteed for that year. So maybe it doesn't start week one. Maybe it starts week five, week six. Maybe they wait. Maybe they slow play it. Maybe they decide to just have a 10 game season. They're going to want to have at least 10 games. They're going to want to have the playoffs. Here's what we do know. No sport has a group of owners less concerned with the welfare (laughs) and health of their players than the NFL. Like if anyone's going to push it through, it's going to be them. And the attitude will just be, all right, he has COVID next guy up up their their whole left side of their offensive line has COVID. Well, allow them to sign some practice squad guys. They're going to have the games. I forget which team talked about quarantining backup quarterbacks, like in a bubble in case to keep them from getting COVID, but having like a COVID roster. I mean, conversely though, to your point about the owners, no group of players is less willing to give up a season than professional mm. football players because of, you know, age and career length. It's not like basketball um, or baseball, right? They, they, I would guess, want to play more than athletes in other sports. Right now, the NFLPA um, and the league are negotiating over training camp and what that's going to look like. But I I I imagine the PA, PA is going to try to come to some sort of resolution with them. I think it happens, but I don't think it's 16 games. And I was surprised that they made such a big deal about the schedule and all that stuff because it's like planning for... How do you plan for something when you have no idea what the world's going to look like in September? You know, I I think they should have been a little more emphatic about here's at least a 10-game schedule. And then if we play more than that, here's what that will look like. But we're going to take this more seriously. Plus COVID's getting worse. Obviously everybody knows. I hear. So, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's not slowing down. Turns, turns out a pandemic doesn't slow down when people aren't, uh, aren't, aren't being, uh, healthy enough. What do you think about the NFL having their season in like New Zealand though, or something? Have you heard that? No, no, no. Incredibly irresponsible speculation by me. Oh, I loved it. That was great. I mean, I feel like New Zealand would reject us, although it would be the greatest advertisement for New Zealand, which is gorgeous, right? Every time there's a show like Game of Thrones, everyone wants to go to New Zealand or Czechoslovakia, where do they find Croatia, I think. Yeah. That could be the NFL in New Zealand, like Kiwi football. I don't know. If I just think are. they're going to, I think they're going to have it and they're just going to assume that some teams are going to get decimated by COVID and maybe, you know, just for two weeks, they're just going to, get beaten in the games by a lot of points. And that's just, it'll be, you know, like having a torn SEL multiplied by a hundred. How are people going to gamble? It's going to be bizarre. 
the, the, I mean, the fantasy and gambling ramifications, much less the health and uh, many more important things. I, I have to get used to dropping those caveats in with somber tones, right. but they're going to be enormous uh, if any of these rosters have any sort of, uh, I guess, flexibility in that regard. I, I think now that we're four, basically four months since Rudy Gobert, March 11th, that that whole day, I think people have completely lost their minds at this point. And if there's stuff to do and things to watch and fantasy and gambling and information to find out and uh, reloading Adam Schefter's Twitter feed over and over again to see if somebody had a last minute COVID or not. I, I think people are all in. There's it's nothing to do. It's interesting to me that we're treating COVID revelations you know, with velvet gloves and there's a little bit of weirdness, like uh, you don't want to report who has it or doesn't have it when our industry will report immediately when like a running back, you know, towards yeah. MCL or like seconds. And I, I, I'm not quite understanding the disjunct between those things, which I guess reflects more poorly on the fact that we re report on their actual injuries to begin with and less about the COVID thing. But yeah, it's going to be super weird. I mean, college football right now is on the brink. That's been the story today and this week. I, I mean, don't see that. I, I never thought that was happening because there's too much liability for the campuses and you know, I, I just don't see it. I got so excited for football to happen when the cam news broke. I mean, mm. that was the first time I think this whole summer that I really prayed to the football gods that we got a season. Now, you know, just because the excitement around it, the idea of seeing it, um, just seeing, as you said, that whole experiment of it was so fascinating to me. And I don't know. This whole time, I think like football's been so weird because obviously they've benefited from being the second mover and getting to wait and having the calendar move later. But nothing, everything has just proceeded normally, right? We had this offseason, we had the draft, nothing changed at all. But when I saw that piece of news, it hit me like this might not, if this doesn't happen, I'm not going to see any of this play out um, for the first time in my life. Yeah, CBS showed Chiefs Titans to go over the weekend. And I so, caught the fourth quarter and I was just kind of watching it. And I was like, man, life was so simple. <laughs> the end of January, just, just trying to ride the Titans, hoping that they were going to cover and they're down 11. And I was like, man, I remember when just getting upset that the Titans couldn't cover that spread was like the, my biggest issue in a weekend. That was coming off of, I think the worst call of my career coming on your show and guaranteeing a Titans victory or a Ravens victory rather over over the time. I think that is actually the worst prediction I've ever made. Uh, Has Mallory talked to you? She's talked to you since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think she's bounced back. She's feeling optimistic, um, about her well, squad. She should, she should feel optimistic. I, I think they, that they're probably as good as Kansas city. Lamar's on Madden. It's done. It's they, over. They, they, yeah. Throw the black hat on that team. Wasn't Mahomes Madden the year before? <laughs> Was he? <laughs> Did he Maybe break not. the Did curse? I, that up? I thought I it was know. like two years before. I don't yeah. know. If that, he broke the curse, then I recant my comment. I might be wrong about that. How did you feel about me working with your coach, Pete Carroll? I um, technically now a ringer coworker of mine since we've done 10 podcasts. I know that was surreal for you. I like that podcast a lot, by the way. It's good. Um, it's going to be going away because they have real jobs and real lives, but we got an maybe. amazing short run out of them. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I'm being I, optimistic. I, I actually um, did a thing with Pete recently. Um, or he has this book coming out with that yeah. performance psychologist that he worked with. Uh, and I, I, I never read self-help books. I, I've, ne I've actually never read like, I don't know, maybe that's the wrong way to describe it. It's a performance psychology book. But yeah. I read the whole thing. And after I read it, I like wanted to run through a wall. I totally got it. Like the whole Pete thing. And obviously he's, he's obviously an incredible coach and I get, I've interviewed Seahawks players who speak to sort of the culture he establishes there and, um, you know, why they love him so much and how he gives them the freedom to be themselves. And, you know, I've, I'll criticize decisions he makes as a coach and get frustrated. Um, I guess at times with Seattle and, that they don't let Russell Wilson throw the ball more. But um, after reading that, like, I felt like I got it completely. I, and, and I also felt like I, I now have no idea what it takes to be a good coach and I should shut up every time I'm asked going forward because it's so much more complicated than I thought.
Well, it does seem the thing I've learned from the episodes and even talking to them in the little pre-show thingies we have or whatever, is just how much luck yeah. needs to happen to become a good coach because it's like who you ran into at different points in your life, job experiences you had, a break you got that you weren't expecting to get. And it's almost like this video game where you're completing these levels and you don't even realize it. And then all of a sudden you're in a position of power and you're trying to use all this knowledge you had. And, um, it, it's no wonder there's not very many good coaches. It's well, a really it's hard job. Like two of the best coaches in the NFL are Pete Carroll and Bill Belichick who couldn't be more different in literally every way as human beings. So it's hard to like use those two examples and draw even a line, any lines between them, I suppose, other than that they both ended up with really good quarterbacks. <laughs> and I think um, right. that, you know, it's kind of a chicken or egg thing with both of them. Pete's, Pete and Steve, they both do the same thing about they – they're really invested in their players and not just the stars. They really yeah. try to have a feel for everyone on their roster. And because I think both of them, neither of them were great players, right? Steve had a better career than Pete did, but both of them were in the position of not being an essential part of the team, but a smaller essential part. So understanding the value of basically everybody. And, uh, I don't know. I've learned a lot from it. I, I just don't think they're, I always get criticized cause I always, shit on coaches too much. I don't think there's a lot of great coaches, but my expectations are probably also really too high for coaches in general because I think it's a fucking hard job. But what you just described, like, okay, Pete Carroll, you're right. So the whole, his whole audio book is about that. Oh, I, you know, I, I get to know these guys as human beings and think about what motivates them. And I think about, you know, I use that information to then coach them and, and develop them and give them opportunities Bill Belichick's never done that day in his life, right? Like, I mean, we always hear these stories about a guy who, you know, even like a Julian Edelman type, not like a end of the roster scrub, who has an awkward conversation with Bill for the first time, you know, mm. that lasts more than seven minutes. Um, and I, I'm not saying that means Pete's strategy is wrong. It just kind of makes you think, okay, maybe there really are many different ways to be a good coach. No question. Like the... One of the most famous Belichick shots, they win, they beat the Rams in the Super Bowl. Laura Malloy runs over. Belichick's hugging his wife or his daughter, I can't remember. And Laura Malloy's in there and it's a three person hug. And you're just like, wow, those guys are so close. Then he shanks Laura Malloy straight to the <laughs> Buffalo or waved them. I forget, but he waved them. And Laura Malloy ended up a Buffalo, but it was like he he gets what he needs out of you for the season. And then that's it. You might be gone. I think I, I truly do believe now that he was ready to get rid of Brady three years ago and Brady knew it. And I think that did probably start the yeah, I, enough stuff's come out that it seems pretty confident. That's what happened. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, now the conversation is like, yes, I agree with you by the way about the Brady stuff. And now the conversation is about, okay, well, how does personality mesh with Newton's right? It doesn't fucking matter. Right? Bill Belichick doesn't care what Cam Newton's personality... And I don't mean this... We all know the character thing is BS, right? We were talking about a football team that signed Antonio Brown last year. We don't even have to have that fake conversation. But the idea that Bill Belichick cares about anything other than what Cam Newton can do on the football field is like ridiculous. Kyle and I were talking about that before. People act like Belichick has shied away from players with <laughs> charisma and personality. It's been the complete opposite. Yeah. We fucking traded for Randy Boss. Who... Who in the 2000s, other than maybe T.O., was somebody who had, like, more baggage and, uh-oh, this guy, oh, he's, he's selfish, blah, 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 than Randy Moss. And he loved Randy Moss. Randy Moss was a great patriot. I don't I, think, I never understood that angle. I think the greatness of Bill Belichick, it's funny, think about him and Carol kind of in conjunction because I think they have, like I said, they have very different personalities, very different qualities. And I think probably have things that are lacking in the other. Like I think Bill Belichick could probably benefit from a little bit of Pete Carroll's culture building, mm. um, his eye for development, quite frankly. Um, whereas I think Carroll could benefit from Belichick's malleability, his willingness to completely shed scheme, right? I, I like, I will never forget, you know, like, God, I feel like I, I've brought this up with you before, but that Ram Super Bowl and watching that Patriots defense just completely do everything differently from how they had played all season, you know, going mm. from man to zone and, and running that front. And I just, I think 
that Belichickian quality of being willing to be completely amorphous and tied to nothing and just week, not even on like a season to season basis, but on a week to week basis, play those sorts of games is something that's so missing in coaches across the NFL. It's something that I thought um, Cliff Kingsbury actually did a really good job of last year and really impressed me. The fact that he was completely able a few games into the season when he just threw it, tossed aside air raid and started running the football, which nobody thought he would do. Um, and did started moving away from all the concepts he'd used in college and, and became, they actually became like one of the most successful running teams in the NFL. I think that, to me, is the most, I don't want to say, like the key determinant of success in coaching in the NFL. But to me, like if I'm looking at great coaches throughout history, that's one quality that I see in a lot of them. Harbaugh did it with Lamar, right? Completely threw, destroyed that offense. Something that other coaches looked at Lamar Jackson and were not willing to do. And I feel like if I was a football team hiring a coach, I'd somehow try to test for that or look for that malleability because I think it's predictive. You know, it's funny. Basketball is like that too. Cause I think the, the basketball coaches that quote unquote have the system doesn't, doesn't work. Cause you know, right. you, you, you never know who your players are going to be year to year. The ones that have kind of figured out how to adapt to who, to whoever they have. I always thought that was Belichick's best trait. And that's why the irony of all of this, they are the most fun team that could have gotten Cam Newton. Yeah. Because totally. th they're going to, Whatever they think he could do, they're going to unleash it. And I don't know. I really like watching him. You know, they, they, irrespective of him being on the team, like I just, I enjoyed when he was healthy and I really thought him and him and Wilson were two of the guys that I just always enjoyed watching on a Sunday, you know, and, and it was a bummer that he was hurt the last two years. Go back and watch the 2018 Ravens game, uh, Carolina when Cam before he got hurt right when he was in the North Turner offense which I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about how great you know yeah. like everyone Those talks about what a great games. job yeah, yeah so watch that game in particular and watch the things that Norv was doing with them how good he was in that quick passing game the use of misdirection all stuff that New England lo will love to do I mean over the last two years he's actually been a better quick passer than Brady okay mm. and, and Brady I think there's a number of reasons why he struggled a lot of it has to do with the talent around not like Cam, Cam Newton was playing with world beaters he can do all of that in New England to great effect behind a much better offensive line by the way I know no Dante is scary but I, I mean yeah he, and you're right he's just joyful to watch I think him like Deshaun Watson probably is up there on my joyful rank like just guys I just love to watch play football right now um, but when he's healthy he's definitely in the mix and 503 million Pat Mahomes I don't think that's a real number. Yeah, it's not. I, I just read an article about the guarantee mechanisms things, which seemed kind of like made up, you know, when that came out. I didn't really understand it. Everybody pretended you, to understand it at first. You should have told ESPN to do that when they gave you your last contract that it was worth <laughs> like $230 million with incentives. Like, it, we could just make up any number with a football contract. And people actually report it. Like, my son came to me. He's like, Dad. Pat Mahomes signed for five hundred and three million. I'm like, no, he didn't. No, don't, don't read that. Twelve year olds are getting fooled by these NFL contracts. Actually, I have a take on that, and I would love to run it by you as a Brady apologist. Mm. Okay, so the apologist. Thing, well, formerly. Yeah. Thing about Cam, uh, Pat Mahomes is he's not actually fun to talk about because he's so good. Like. The day after he signed his contract, I went on all of our shows, right? Like around the horn, whatever. And it's like, Pat Mahomes signed a $500 million fake contract. Like, you know, was he worth it? And everyone's like, yeah. Like, he's so unequivocally the best quarterback in the NFL. He's not actually yeah. a debate topic, right? I think, I don't think Brady, and, and this is more about, this has a lot to do with the quarterbacks around him, Rodgers at times, Peyton, whatever. I don't think there was ever a year where he was like that, where you looked at him and you said, there is no debate right now. Because I don't think with Pat Mahomes, there's any debate. I know Lamar was MVP last year and I love him, but I don't think there's a debate. Do yeah. you ever think Brady was like that? I think a no seven he was. The offense was a world-beating offense. But you think he was he unimpeachably... Was, he, was, he was just great in 07. When going into that 08 season, I think... I think people felt like he was the guy. And then I think after the Atlanta Super Bowl, ironically, when people were like begrudging, like, all right, I guess he's the best. Like that was unbelievable. But you're right. He hasn't 
my, to me, Mahomes is almost more like an NBA player where it's, you know, when, uh, I don't know, like when Shaq in 2000, when he won the MVP and he won his first title and he just ripped through the league. Everybody's like, Shaq's the best. Right. So M- Mahomes has hit that almost like more of an NBA type. We've always argued about quarterbacks. I don't feel like even with Rodgers, there were some people like, he's the best, he's the best. There were other, other ones who were like, eh, he's only won one Super Bowl, blah, blah, blah. Well, you're talking about the distinction between the best and the most accomplished. Like Tom Brady is the most accomplished quarterback in the history of the NFL, and there's, it's not right debatable. But I do think it's debatable whether he's the most talented. That was always the the divergence between him sure. and Rodgers. Rodgers is more talented, Brady's more accomplished. I think Mahomes, obviously, he can't be the most accomplished. It's too early in his career, but he's undeniably the most talented guy right now. The play Mahomes made to basically save their Super Bowl, I in, think, in, as the months pass. Wasp, in the in the game itself, the, you mean. The third and 14, yeah, third and Hill, whatever. Yeah, yeah. The 11-yard drop back, fucking so, heave <laughs> right as he's about to get hit. It's so and sick. I'm just like, nobody else in the league <laughs> ever made that throw? It's just not, ha- and it saved their season. I don't know. I just don't know who else could have made that play. The whole playoff so, run. I mean, the Titans game, the Texans game. Like, I don't. I mean, his ability to like put his team completely on his back is unreal. So yeah, it's not. It's not fun to argue. Yeah. Good God damn it. He could be the next guy. Like he. It, this could be like the be- the next Belichick Brady run. Could be Mahomes for like the next twelve years because especially with the way the rules have moved into the favor of having a quarterback like that. And if he's by far the best one, I, you know, that's a really interesting point. I'm trying to think who was the de facto. There's no question about it. This is the best guy quarterback. It's been a while. Like even Manning versus Brady was a whole thing. The whole two thousands trying to like Kurt Warner. Nobody felt that way about it, even after that one year he had Elway, Marino, Montana, I guess the last time was after in the late eighties when I was in college, when Montana, Montana won one of those Super Bowls by like 40 points or whatever. I'm just Damn. saying what it was like when we were there, we were like, Montana's the best. Right. Like we all, we were, we were like, it's done. We're not arguing about this anymore. Like but that was a thing for two years. Now it's so fascinating though, too, because our understanding of quarterback play is so much more sophisticated, right? We're not mm. like using wins. We can break down every, we can isolate what the quarterback does. We can, focus on the contributions of the other players. We can incorporate running in a way I don't think in the past people who talked about football were able to do or were like too racist to do. Now we yeah. can do all these things. And, and even with all of that information, any way you slice the data, any play, you whether you're a tape guy or a numbers guy or, a, you know, just a guy who does care about wins, he wins every debate. And he seems like a nice guy. Like, right. he's totally unimpeachable. And your point about whether you can redo the Brady Belichick thing. I mean, he's got Andy, who's, who I'm wearing an Andy Reid shirt right now. Like, he has that. He has the genius coach on his side, and they're perfectly in sync. And if Andy, I believe he does want to keep coaching for a long time, like Mahomes has rejuvenated him by all accounts. Um, if he can do that for like six more years, they could absolutely, I think, match the total. Yeah, I think Andy's what, 62, 63 now? Early he, 60s. He gave a quote the other day about how like, Mahomes, it was, I hate using the like second wife thing again, but it was like, it, it re, like he was like, I wake up and it just made me see the world in color again. I mean, he's had some good quarterbacks, but I think for a f- offensive minded coach, which is, I think differentiates him from Bill, having someone who can execute all of your wildest dreams and fantasies on the football field, it must be so immensely validating. Well, it reminds me of the NBA thing where, like Popovich gets Duncan and he yeah. just knows he won the lottery. And he's like, I'm yeah. never leaving as long as this guy's healthy. And I think Kerr feels the same way about Curry. Totally. You, you don't see it happen as much with the football. Yeah. And you, usually like the quarterbacks get rid of the coaches after a few years. <laughs> this, in this case, it's, it's a marriage for a long time. So NFL live, when does, when does it kick in? When do you start doing that all the time? Is it now or is it like next month? Uh, the hope is August, mid August. Yeah. And, um, I think that's my new job titles, NFL analyst. Uh, so I'll be on Mondays, Tuesdays, Fridays with Laura Rutledge is hosting Marcus Spears, Dan Orlovsky, some Keyshawn Johnson and Ryan Clark in the mix as well. It's exciting. Thank you. I'm very excited. I really hope there's football to talk about. Me Otherwise too. it would be pretty odd. 
It was good seeing you. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you too.